Hello, and welcome to the recording of Ready, Set, Go, Preparing for a Photo Tour. This is a free online workshop. I am your host, Jennifer Lee Warner, a conservation photographer and CEO of Experience Wildlife. I'm a Nikon professional, a certified Texas master naturalist, and the ethics committee chair for the North American Nature Photographers Association. I'm also a mentor, a workshop leader, a speaker, and a photojournalist. My um, images have been on display in exhibits all over the world, as well as in publications, both in print and online. So during this presentation, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to prepare for a photo trip. We're going to talk about some of the new COVID rules that um, have to do with travel, um, some travel prep, what to do before you leave for your photo trip, and some packing tips, as well as what kind of equipment to bring and some other things to consider. So if you are like me, you are probably feeling a little bit of um, ready to get out and go during the last few years with all of the craziness with lockdowns and travel restrictions. And now that things are starting to open up again, you're ready to hit the road. So maybe your bags are already packed and you've got all the equipment that you want to get going. And maybe you are just starting to dream about a photo trip and starting to wonder what kind of question should I ask if I do book a, a photo trip? You might wonder what kind of, um, what kind of travel restrictions have changed? What kind of things have happened throughout the, um, the last few years when it comes to what to expect when it comes to travel. So um, we're gonna talk about some of those things. Um, you might be um, already booked on a photo tour or you might be just thinking about a photo tour, but whichever that is, um, we're going to go with the assumption that you already have a travel tour in mind and what to do next. So um, a couple things to consider is what are you going to want to confirm with your tour leader? This is all information that you should be able to gather from your, um, whether it's a tour leader, a tour company, whatever you're using. Um, so these are the kind of things you should start to think about. Things like what is included in the tour? What's not included in the tour? What kind of travel documents will you need? Um, whether um, what kind of weather you are expecting for this photo tour. Um, think about um, what kind of arrangements do you need to make for traveling to that location? Is that something that is arranged ahead of time or is that something that you're gonna have to do on your own? Most photo tours start at the location of the tour. So getting to that location is usually on the participants um, side. Think about what kind of vaccines will you need, not just COVID, but you might need things like um, yellow fever or typhoid or things like that in order to enter certain countries. And then what kind of equipment do you um, need to bring in order to um, have a successful photo trip? And again, what kind of physical requirements are needed for this trip? So all things that you need to consider. Now, um, depending on where you're going, all of these details are going to be different, but we're going to use one trip as an example for this um, presentation, and that is a trip that I have coming up in June to Namibia. So this tour is through a company called Holbrook Travel, and it is a partner of mine that I use to book all of my arrangements while I am leading the photo tour. So Going back to that list of questions of what we need to consider, things like um, what is included. So in this case for this Namibia trip, um, accommodations, so included being lodging, including private bathrooms and all the lodges, activities and meals. So sometimes tours include meals, sometimes they don't. So in this case, most of the meals are included. Um, tips, that's another one that can vary um, between tours, 
and tips are included in this Namibia trip. So something to ask if you don't see that listed. Um, arrival and departure transfers. So that's an important one. If you are expecting to meet at a lodge, um, how are you gonna get to and from that lodge from um, an airport or from your home? Uh, bottled water or refill stations. So that's important, especially in countries where water may not be as easily accessible. Um, carbon offsetting. This is something that is becoming more and more common for tour companies to start adding an, a carbon offset um, price that is either included or not included. Full-time drivers um, and guides. So this is also uh, an important note that you're going to have an additional driver, which means that in this particular tour, your photo leader is not going to be the driver. Um, that means they're going to be able to give you the full attention and be able to chat while you're moving from location to location. And then non-alcoholic beverages. So very few tours actually have alcoholic beverages um, that are included. So um, that's just something to consider if you'd like to have a glass of wine at the end of the day um, that you might have an additional cost. So um, I am going to jump into a good question from Linda that got asked in the chat box. And what does our carbon offset mean? Good question, Linda. So carbon offset is, um, so there's a uh, kind of a concept that has been really brought to attention, particularly when it comes to tours that are um, in a, na a natural setting. And that is the fact that we're spending a lot of um, fossil fuel getting to these locations, things like air travel and car travel. Um, and so there are um, ways of donating back into um, organizations that are working towards helping climate change. And so putting aside some money that um, essentially offsets that, that charge of um, spending the fossil fuels <laughs> to get to the location, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, but great question and definitely one that I had when I first um, heard that as well. Um, all right, so things that consider that are not included in a tour, um, international flights. So most tours are gonna be like that where you are not in getting your international flights included. Mostly that's because people are coming from all different locations. So to have one set price would be very difficult. So um, international flights, um, whether you're booking it yourself or whether or not you're having the company or the tour leader book that for you is a good question to ask. Um, items of a personal nature, you're gonna see that very often in tours not included. Um, again, that's if you needed to stop by a store and pick up a toothbrush or um, a bar of soap or something like that. So items of a personal nature, um, you know, whether they're souvenirs or any of those things are not going to typically be included. And then lastly, travel insurance. That's also something that I highly recommend anyone get for a photo tour but um, is very rarely included. So there's a variety of different types of insurance that you can get. Um, and especially in this day and age when things are so rapidly getting um, shifted and canceled and you know all of these rule changes, um, travel insurance is a really important one. All right, so something else to consider. Um, so entry and exit requirements. So if you are going to an, a location that's out of the US, you might wanna know about what kind of requirements are going to be expected of you when you enter that country. So using our Namibia trip as an example, um, having a valid passport is going to be an absolute requirement and not just a valid passport, but one that has at least six months before the expiration date and um, expires and also that um, you had at least six or more blank pages in your passport. Um, this is a pretty common rule for entering most countries. Um, now, if you are visiting, um, in this case, Namibia, you do not have to get a visa ahead of time. That's something you can get upon arrival. Um, so if you are entering Namibia without a U.S. passport, like say you are a citizen of a different country, um, then that's something you're going to have to look into with the embassy on what the rules and restrictions are for that country. 
other things to consider is um, immunizations. So um, with, again, our example of Namibia, the, um, the rules for vaccines is that they have recommendations, um, but there are no absolute requirements. So measles, mumps, and uh, rubella is one that they do recommend that you get, as well as tetanus and chicken pox. And that's just te typical immunizations that you would want from being in the US. Um, another one that is not required, but recommended would be the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and we'll get into that here in a minute as well. Um, something else that is tends to be a good idea is the hepatitis. Um, a, as well as the typhoid vaccine, um, not required, but a good one to think about if you're talking to your physician. Now, malaria um, is prevalent in Africa and is something that um, I would definitely recommend that you look into getting, um, typically they're tablets, but there's a couple different forms of getting protection from malaria. And this is something that you would need to get from a physician. So um, just getting a prescription to get for your anti-malaria drug is a, a recommendation, but not a requirement. Um, there are some side effects to the malaria um, pill that you would need to consult with your physician about, um, which can include if you are pregnant, they don't recommend you taking that. Um, so just something to consider. Um, the last thing for recommendations is protecting yourself from sun exposure. The sun is very um, strong in Africa. So you want to make sure that you're using SPF, um, both sunscreen as well as having some of that sun protection in your clothes is a good idea. All right, so weather, something else to consider. Now, um, if you are going to somewhere, say like, again, Namibia, Namibia is a pretty big country. So saying, well, what's the weather like in Namibia during time, different types of year? You also want to consider what's the weather like in certain areas that you're going to. So using that as an example, if you look up um, climatestotravel.com, it's going to tell you not only just the country and different times of year and the weather, but also different areas of the country. So if you're headed to the coast, you're going to have a lot more um, mild climates than if you're headed inland where it might be a little bit warmer. So our Namibia trip is in June. You can see that the, um, the minimum um, Fahrenheit for the coast is 52 degrees with a max of 68. So very mild weather um, there along the coast, but not too cold. Whereas if you move inland, even just a little bit, you're going to see much warmer temperatures like, um, and, and more drastic too, 46 to 75 in June. So it's going to swing a little bit more when you head more into that drier climate. So things to think about. All right, so um, like we said before, international travel is very rarely included in photo tours. So it's something you're gonna need to think about. So using a travel agent in order to book those is a great idea. It makes sure that you're um, you know, considering all the things you need to consider like arrival time, you know, leaving time, making sure it's the right airport. So I highly recommend using a travel agent in order to um, book your flight. Now, if you're a very seasoned traveler like me, um, you might be able to book your own travel. And I'm gonna tell you a very secret tip that I use in order to save money when I'm traveling. So if you are going to a very um, popular destination and it's going to require a long distance and perhaps multiple transfers, instead of just booking the first one you see, do a little research ahead of time and you might be able to find a cheaper deal by splitting up your flight um, instead of doing just booking one flight. So what I mean by this is um, if you're going to say, we're going to use this as an example because this is a real life example. I was on my way to India and we were meeting in Calcutta, which is a pretty major city. And when I looked online to book from where I lived in California to going to Calcutta, 
Um, it wanted to transfer me through Hong Kong, which at the time there was a little civil unrest, which I was a little uncomfortable with that transfer. Um, so instead of booking from California to Calcutta, the next biggest city was New Delhi, which is a very big hub in India. So booking from California to New Delhi and then booking a separate smaller flight from New Delhi to Calcutta, I managed to save $800 and also save 12 hours of travel time because of my layovers. Um, this is a really um, kind of sneaky way of booking that makes things a little easier on you and a lot easier on your pocketbook. Now, there is a warning to doing this. Um, you do want to make sure that you give yourself a very long layover in between that first flight and that smaller um, in-country flight because you are going to have to leave security to get your bag if you checked it and then re-go back through security in order to um, recheck into your flight. You're also going to have to go through customs at that point. So these are all things to really consider if you're going to do this, but you might be able to save quite a bit of money. Now, if you are flying domestically, there's another little hack that I have that is if you are going to a major city that has multiple airports nearby, such as Los Angeles or New York City, um, check and see what the other airports prices are. Um, a lot of times these airports are within a half an hour of each other and can vary in price dramatically. So make sure you do a little research before you just start booking flights. Okay, so with um, COVID, there's new travel restrictions and they're always changing. So what I say during this presentation could very well change as soon as tomorrow. So definitely do your research before you leave. But a couple things that are happening right now, one of them being um, your need to get a negative COVID test before you either travel or before you return home. This is um, something that is happening very regularly in a lot of countries. Again, using Namibia as our example, you do need a negative COVID test um, before you enter Namibia. And this is something, this, this part can be kind of confusing, but you actually get it checked before you get on the airplane. So you have to have it by the time you get on the airplane, not necessarily by the time you arrive in that country. So if you have layovers and things like that, um, those are going to be different. Um, you do have to um, get it approved by a doctor. So if you do get an in-home test, that's something that has to be looked at by a proctor to make sure that you are doing it properly. Um, and then the same thing with going back to the United States. As of right now, the United States does require a negative COVID um, test in order to re-enter the country. Now, if you do test positive, you just have to keep taking the test until you test negative. So um, that might mean you have a false positive, or if you really did contract COVID-19 while you were there, you're just going to have to stay and wait it out until you are um, free and clear to come back. So again, this is where travel insurance is going to be really important. All right, masks. Now, again, this is a rule that's been drastically changing um, every few weeks. So as of today on March 23rd, 2022, um, masks are required in just about every airline that I know of. Um, and that means you're covering both your nose and mouth while you're on the airplane. Now, if you are eating or drinking, you can remove your mask, but only for the time that you're eating or drinking. So it's gonna be something that you're just maybe taking a bite and putting your mask back on while you chew. It's a little uncomfortable, but certainly better than the alternative. Um, and this also applies for being in the airports as well. Um, now, as far as having the mask on when you're in vehicles or lodges, that's all gonna depend on where you are and what is the comfort level of your tour group. So something just to ask and be polite. And of course, if you wanna wear a mask, then by all means, make sure you're wearing a mask. Um, okay, so talking about the COVID-19 vaccine, and I'm only bringing this up because these are tend to be rules that um, are for traveling. Um, if the area you are in requires you to have a COVID-19 vaccine, which a lot of times, especially in places like Europe, um, in order to enter restaurants or 
in museums or anywhere like that, they do require you to show your vaccine card. Um, and what this means is that you are vaccinate, fully vaccinated by one of these approved um, drugs, which is either the Johnson & Johnson, the Pfizer or Madrona. Um, there are some that are used for emergency use, um, but I think this more applies to other countries. And then um, that does mean that you have um, either the single dose of the Johnson & Johnson or have gone through both doses of the Pfizer or Madrona, and it's two weeks after you've had the final dose. So this doesn't necessarily mean you need the booster. Um, if that is something you, you haven't gotten, it's not a requirement. It's just that you have um, at least the either the single dose of Johnson Johnson or the two doses of Pfizer and Madrona. All right, so moving away from vaccines and into the fun stuff like equipment. So what kind of things might you need for photography equipment? Um, depending on where you're going and what you're photographing, um, that might change dramatically on what you're going to bring. But for a standard photo trip, some things to consider is um, if you can bring in two camera bodies, not everybody has this possibility, but if you do have two, I recommend bringing them both. Not only will this help prevent if you break one, you'll have an extra camera, but it also um, means that you'll be able to not have to switch lenses as often, especially in areas that are dusty or sandy. Um, having a telephoto lens of at least 400 millimeter or larger is recommended for wildlife, for birds and mammals. And then a wide angle lens if you wanna photograph things like landscapes. Um, having extra memory cards is a good idea. And the rule of thumb I tend to say is one memory card per field day. Um, and then an extra camera battery, if possible. Um, if you are in areas that tend to be pretty cold, um, they can drain your battery quicker. Um, so you want to make sure that you are um, not running out of a camera battery in the middle of your day. Um, also, external hard drives for downloading the pictures, a laptop for downloading the pictures, and a tripod. Now, a tripod is something that you might only need if you are planning on photographing in low light or waterfalls or standing for a very long time, like you're photographing, um, say you're photographing a bear for a very long time. Um, so if you don't think you're gonna use the tripod, you can eliminate this from your camera lit or your equipment list and save on the weight because tripods do tend to be a little heavier um, and can take up space in your bag. I do recommend that you familiarize yourself beforehand um, when you are getting equipment. If you have a new equipment, um, I wouldn't recommend pulling it out of the box for the first time when you're in the field. You're going to miss more shots than you're gonna get in that case. So familiarize yourself with your equipment before you head out. And then decide if you're gonna rent or buy. So if you don't have equipment right now, um, you can either buy new equipment or rent it. And deciding whether or not you're going to buy or rent may determine a couple different factors. So before I make that decision, I ask myself a few questions. So first off, how often am I going to need this equipment after this tour? Is now a good time to invest in photography equipment? If I rent instead of buy, can I use better equipment for this special trip? Um, and do I need something special that I probably won't need again for a while. So a good example of renting something would be like a longer lens. If you don't typically photograph wildlife, um, but you are planning on photographing wildlife for this trip, renting a bigger lens instead of investing in, you know, at least a thousand dollars in an equipment might make sense. So things to consider, but only you know the answer. Um, if you are planning on renting, um, I recommend borrowedlenses.com. Um, they do a fantastic job of um, getting you equipment um, to and from very quickly, and they have a great variety of different types of cameras and lenses to rent. Okay, so let's talk about packing. So um, a couple things to think about. Now, this will definitely 
depend on the location that you're traveling to. If you're going to a cold location versus a warm location or vice versa, your packing list is going to be very different. But um, a couple things to consider. One, hiking boots, um, comfortable shoes when you're not wearing your hiking boots, um, pants for in the field that you don't mind getting dirty. If you are out of a safari vehicle, maybe you're on a beach, um, you might want to lay down on your stomach if you're capable of that to get eye level with your subjects. And in that case, you might be getting a little dirty. So definitely something you don't mind getting dirty. Um, pants for when you're not in the field. So maybe you want to head into town or go out to eat and you don't want to be wearing your muddy clothes that you were laying in the sand. Um, so a change of clothes. Um, also a dressier outfit for nicer outings. I always try to pack one skirt every time I travel. Um, sweat resistant tops. You're, if you're in a warmer climate, you're probably going to be sweating a little bit. So that might um, be a good idea to get some sweat resistance um, tops. Thick socks. Um, even in warmer climate, this is a good idea to protect your feet um, from getting um, chafing in your boots. Uh, don't forget your pajamas, underwear, and of course, a light jacket. Even in warm climates, having a light jacket is a good idea, particularly for evenings. And then a hat, sunscreen, sunglasses, toiletry, hand sanitizer. Um, that's something that uh, um, nowadays is always important. And then um, face masks. So I say masks, not just one, because you're probably going to want to switch them out at least once every few days if you are wearing them um, quite frequently. And then medications. So don't forget whatever medications you typically take throughout the day. Um, other things to consider is cash. Um, now, I recommend both taking US cash and the local currency where you're going. Um, something to note is that if you're gonna change money, I tend to find the exchange rate Exchange rate is better in the country that you're going to. So for example, um, if you are headed to Africa and you wanna exchange the money, the exchange rate tends to be better when you get to Africa. However, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story to just warn anyone who's traveling to another country. Um, I went to India and everyone told me, wait to change the dollars to rupees until you got there because the exchange rate was terrible in the U.S. And when I got to um, where I was going, no one would exchange my money. Um, I had a really, really hard time exchanging my money. Um, they only wanted um, the newer hundred dollar bills in order to change currency, which I didn't have. I had either older bills or twenty dollar bills and they wouldn't take it. And um, this was the same with everyone in my tour group. So for at least a week, um, my entire tour group went around with no money. Luckily, um, we were already on a tour and everything had been covered. So we didn't really need to have cash, but it's always a good idea to have some. So make sure you change a little bit, but um, do the majority of your changing in country if possible. Um, something else to consider is a power converter. So you want to make sure that you can use the, the power um, for plugging in things um, where you are and different countries have different power converters. So make sure you look that up. <clears throat> make sure you bring your passport as well as get a photocopy of it. You don't want to accidentally lose your passport and not have one while you're in the country. So at least to have a copy of it. This same thing goes for your vaccine card. Um, for you know COVID-19, as well as if you have any other vaccines um, like the yellow fever vaccine, um, I got a card for that as well. So make sure you photocopy that. And then of course, cell phone charger. And I like to carry a small fold up day pack. So I don't have to carry my big heavy camera bag every time I go out. So if I wanna run to um, the local market or do something um, that I don't need my big camera bag, I will bring a little small fold up pack. Okay, so we mentioned power converter. Um, I like to use these. The, these ones um, you can get at you know, Walmart, Target, any of the standard um, department stores and they will um, change according to where you are. So you can use these in a lot of different countries, which is really nice. 
All right, for packing, I highly recommend packing pods. This is something you can buy online or again in the store like Target or Walmart, things like that. Um, this helps you segregate your clothes and makes it a lot easier to find what you're looking for, especially if you're re-wearing clothes. So, um, I, you know, if you're just sorting out, you know, I have all my shirts in this pod, I have all my pants in this pod, all my socks are in that pod. Um, it just makes things a lot easier, especially if you have to take things out at the airport. Okay, so for carry-on luggage, um, make sure you're checking your airline for their specific rules. But um, typically in the United States, um, uh, flights allow one piece of carry-on luggage and a personal item. So the personal item might be um, your purse, a laptop, a small backpack, something that can fit under the seat, and then your bag um, that is gonna go in the overhead bin. And this is typically, um, no more than 45 inches long. Um, so, and usually around 40 pounds. So make sure you're checking with your airline because they can all be a little bit different. Um, something that I noticed with smaller airlines when you're transferring is that they might have completely different restrictions. So when I was going from South Africa to Namibia the last time, um, they were only allowing for um, 17 pounds for my carry-on luggage, which for me, the, my camera bag is much heavier than that. So um, a good tip is to separate your laptop, if you're going to bring one, from your camera bag. So that's your second piece of luggage. Um, and then only pack the essentials in the, in the camera bag. For check bags, that typically means you're having um, one check bag. Um, and that it's no bigger than 50 pounds, or you're going to be paying an excessive um, bag weight. So again, each airline is a little different. Make sure you're following those rules. Um, some do not allow as much as 50 pounds and some allow more. So just check your airlines before you leave. And um, a couple tips for packing. So putting your camera battery chargers, the flashes, straps, any other accessories in your care or in your check bag is going to lighten your load for your carry-on. And then divide up the weight between your carry-on items so that you don't have all of them in one heavy bag. Wearing your jacket and your heaviest shoes is also going to lighten your load because um, they don't weigh what is physically on you. And then um, for packing, wearing multiple, your, you know, your clothes for multiple days is fine, um, unless you're somebody who tends to spill on yourself a lot. Um, I highly recommend just planning on wearing your clothes for a couple of days in a row in order to um, save on the weight. Also, uh, packing a little bit of laundry detergent will allow you to wash your clothes if they do get excessively dirty. And then leave room for souvenirs. Um, if you're anything like me, I like to get souvenirs while I'm there, bring back presents for people. So make sure you leave room in your bag for that. And that'll also help you plan to pack smaller. <laughs> okay, so a couple tips. Um, I like to put laundry um, dryer sheets in my bag. It absorbs the odor if you are wearing your clothes for multiple days, which allows your clothes to smell fresher. Um, so that's a real nice little hack. Same thing with these Febreze to go um, fabric refreshers. So this is something that you can spray on your clothes in order to make it um, smell fresher, like it just came out of the wash. And then, like I said, souvenirs. Um, one thing I really believe in is supporting local communities. And a good way of doing this is to, um, to purchase art or trinkets from local vendors um, that are reputable. Um, I, I would avoid anyone who's coming up to a vehicle because um, that can sometimes turn into a bit of a mob. Um, but anyone who's who's got an actual little stand um, supporting local communities, I think it's just a really good way of giving back. And um, so I always try to buy a little few things from where I am and bring them back as soon souvenirs or gifts. If you um, aren't a souvenir buyer, that's okay. You can support local communities by 
also visiting them in the local markets. This is in India, the flower market, or you can always bring back yummy things like chocolate. This is when I was in Ecuador, we visited a chocolate plantation um, where they made chocolate. So buying some chocolate bars is a really great way of su supporting the local communities. Okay, so before um, we wrap up and go into Q and A, um, just a few trips that I have coming up. I've got Grand Teton um, this spring on May 21st through 25th. This is um, run by me. Um, I have the entire tour um, set up through my, my own company. It's going to be a lot of fun. This is a great time to see baby animals like bears and moose. Um, and I've been back many, many, many times over the course of about 16 years. I've been going back. So this is one of my favorite times of year. Um, I also have a one day or half a day trip um, in Southern California to see the California sea lion pups that'll have just been born. This is on July 2nd. I have my Alaska tour coming up and the deadline for that trip is coming up as well. And this is um, gonna be in July, the 23rd through 31st. This is also through Holbrook Travel and we're gonna be seeing a lot of really cool um, Alaskan wildlife, including grizzly bears and black bears. Um, whales, otters, and lots of really cool birds like puffins. I also have a fall Grand Teton trip. This is also through my own company. This is September 17th through the 21st. And then a Florida trip. This is also through Holbrook Travel. And um, this is conservation focused. So we're visiting three different conservation organizations while we're in Florida in order to um, really learn about the on the ground efforts of what they're doing to, to support um, local wildlife. And you'll also get an opportunity to be out photographing birds and manatees and all sorts of really cool Florida wildlife. And that is December 5th through 12th. Um, although I don't have it listed here, I do have um, a couple more trips that just got set up today actually. Um, I just partnered with an organization called Wildside um, nature tours, and we will be heading to Yellowstone in January, as well as Grand Teton in May of 2023, and um, back to Grand Teton in um, September of 2023, and that's going to be a women's only trip, so it'll be all women, all together, um, and also led by an inc another incredible wildlife photographer, Elise Bender. So if you have any questions about any of those tours, please reach out to me at uh, jennifer at experiencewildlife.com or you can visit my website at experiencewildlife.com in order to see all of my listings of tours and events. All right, so um, I am going to open it up to any questions and I'm going to stop the recording.